Okay, we're going live. I always have to wave at the camera because there's this delay. And so <laughs> I, I always want to make sure I know when I'm going live and all this kind of fun stuff. So anyway, I think we're live now. And uh, I'm excited today because I get to play with Worthy Maps with two people who I I just, I love you both. You're just so <laughs> amazing. We met at um, Domain Driven Design. E, and we, like we did, I think was it EU, not EU. One of the events that Matthias was running for Domain Driven Design EU, and uh, we'll get we'll get into introducing you both in a minute because our viewers can't see you yet, so it's it's not really a surprise because you're in the description and so on. But we'll get there. Um, welcome everybody. If you're coming back, if you're a returning viewer, thank you for being here. If you're brand new, um, I'm excited that you decided to click on this and even watch this later if you decided to watch it later. Um, we're, gra we're we're grateful to have you here. Um, my name is Ben Mosier. I run a website called learnworthymapping.com, and we also run events, which you can find on the events section of that website. We're really just trying with these live streams to make more examples of worthy mapping. So like the doing of the worthy mapping and also worthy maps themselves, the artifacts. So as many people in the world uh, can look at the work uh, that we do and go, oh, that looks like me. I see how that works. So that's our entire uh, idea here behind these live streams. So thank you for joining us. And uh, if you have thoughts, comments, feedback, find us on Twitter. You can email me at ben at hiredthought.com anytime. Uh, let me know what your feedback is. Okay, so with that out of the way, I'm going to switch to the view that everyone can see now. We've got Xin Yao and Joao Rosa, two amazing architects from the world of domain driven design and many other things. Um, I am so excited because we're going to get to play with Wardley Mapping and DDD today, which is going to be a lot of fun. So let's let's start with um, Shin. Could could I ask you, like, what, how do you view your job in the world? What What is the role of architecture? What is the role of domain-driven design with architecture? Just give us a little bit of background of what you think, how things connect. Right. The way I see architecture and the role of an architect is that we are sort of at the fulcrum between um, a, bus a complex business domain and a IT oriented solution to realize some purpose with that domain to be in short. So bridge building, that's, that's it. Um, and then there's a team perspective to that as well. So that's why uh, I think I call it my, myself a kind of a socio uh, technical architecture because the the organizational aspect and the software uh, uh, aspect go actually hand in hand. So uh, so that's um, that's also what where I think the the Wortley mapping and DDD they just really belong together as, oh. and supplement each other. I love that. Yeah, that the socio technical thing always makes me smile because. I, I used to be a systems administrator, and so I was always like really into the technical, <laughs> like making the computers do what I wanted them to do. Um, and then I realized that there was so much interesting stuff on the social side. Um, so one, one more question, then we'll kind of switch to Joao. Uh, when it comes to the socio side of that socio-technical, I mean, what does that work look like? So... To just give a very, very concrete example, today I actually facilitated a collaborative discovery workshop, which involved eight different squads or teams rather, because our organization has been Spotify. So we're now called tribes and squads. <laughs> so to make eight teams collaborate together to make a a beautiful solution, IT solution uh, to realize some customer journey, user journey. That's a big, that's a tall order, right? Actually, so so there, there's a lot of uh, um, soft skills involved making the teams realize uh, what is the common goal, what is the anchor, and then what are the differences? How do we uh, how do we do this thing together, especially in a large organization with mm. a lot of legacy systems, right? So yeah. making something new on the basis of a big and complex tale, <laughs> uh, uh, eight teams collaborating together. So that's uh, 
that's where I feel that if you don't take the team aspect into your architecture, and if you don't align, if you have a sort of a, a monolithic architecture where you have eight small teams, all uh, stamping on that one, that's not going to work. So we've got to take the social aspect into the um, the ar IT architecture in that way. So mm, yeah. I don't know if that makes the picture more concrete. Yeah, I thought it really illustrated the sort of space that we're working in. And what I want to ask next, and Joao, I'm going to turn to you with this. So a lot of that sounds like negotiation. And I know that, that you all um, do a lot of training in your work. And so I was kind of wondering... How, what are the skills required from your perspective, Joao, to do that kind of socio and technical sense making and negotiation and things like that? Like, what, is, what does this set of problems look like from your angle? It's, it's really a, a, a great question. Also a big one. I will <laughs> try to organize my chaotic mind. So uh, 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 I hope that the, the, the viewers uh, will follow <laughs> me on that do your best but, that's, that's all i'm doing yes. <laughs> let's, let's go so uh, you touch and, and you said sense making and i do believe that that is where it starts right we we structure our trainings and when we give the trainings that are on strategic side of things right for 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 decision makers executives architects within organizations because i also work uh, with organizations that in one way or another produce software and, and sense making part is important. Where people stand, what is the problem? How do they see the world? Because if not, we just have the, the old techniques. I came here and this is the solution and you do as we want, right? And this is uh, uh, perceived as the old style of doing architecture. So understanding where people are, and, and there are interesting exercises to, to go and understand how people view the world, then we can manage the, the 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 some change on on the IT landscape, right? Do we need to move from our data center to the cloud? Do we need to move from these these architectural style to another one? Um, do we need to to go for a commodity component, or do we need more ten teams? I don't know, but at least we get a sense. The other thing that I also usually say, because I engage a lot with senior management is that the answers are on the field, are we the people that execute the work? And doing these sense-making exercises and getting these perspectives will get the voices without getting people screaming in the organization and, and the power uh, battles, right? So it's, mm. it's very interesting how this can combine. And then we're going to see probably today how can we use worldly mapping and, and DDD to, to negotiate boundaries. That mm. I, I think that's... Uh, is, is critical, at least with our industry, negotiating these boundaries and our understanding of these boundaries. Mm. Yeah, negotiation seems like such a, an important part of this because I, I think architecture is in an interesting moment right now. And it's, it's really interesting to see in particular, like the DDD style efforts kind of almost as a, a renaissance of sorts of, of for how architecture should work or how, what kind of practices architects can, can provide or perform. And there's like this, this one version of architecture that tends to be um, prop, like kind of problematic, which is like the, the ivory tower architect, right? Just someone off somewhere examining systems and making decisions and hopefully get <laughs> like basically being, being given the responsibility of all the problems that architects are supposed to be taking care of, like reducing duplication, making sure components are like that. We're thinking beyond the one application and we're thinking across the entire organization and so on. Like it's really tempting this to, to treat that as a one way dynamic where it's like, I'm telling you what to do, or I I'm the only one who can tell, like make the decision here, this version of things. And the version of things that I've seen from the DDD community is a lot messier and I think for the better. Um, and, and that messiness is what attracted me to the space because worthy mapping is all about messes and it's all about negotiating along all sorts of lines. And so let, let's like examine do, domain driven design as a practice first, just so we can kind of get a taste of what we're starting with. Cause I, I have a suspicion that a lot of the folks that will watch this are like DDD, what's that? 
Um, so let's like start there. And I have I have a Miro board that I'll um, just get us sort of started in. And I admit, um, I've, I'm a bit chaotic, so I don't always <laughs> have a nice, neat plan. But like with the goal of providing examples of what it's like to do this work and providing examples of what this work can look like as an output, um, I, I riffed on a uh, hypothetical example, let's say. And I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's gonna work at all for 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 this. So you'll have to maybe like help me course correct and things like that. But um, this was from a a live stream we did the other day around uh, code review and collaborative software development. And uh, it, it was kind of um, playing with the Roadrunner Coyote example from the old cartoons and things like that. Which I don't. You don't have to be particularly familiar with either of those things. Um, but. What might help is if we just take a look at that real quick. Um, Domain-driven design seems to be about domains. Uh, and, and so tell me a little bit about domains and why that's important. I don't know, Shin, do you want to take a shot at that? Right. Domains are, um, you can, uh, uh, well, I, I think of domains as a kind of a, a business problem space um, that serves a particular purpose. It could be um, uh, it could be a kind of a, a a process, a business process. It could also be a particular product domain. Uh, in in big enterprises, we have these all these. Uh, uh, you can say a backend domains like uh, you have a, a user domain, you have a product domain, and then you probably also have an HR. All, all these self-contained uh, business um, areas that can be modeled um, uh, in um, in isolation of their context relatively. Mm. And then they all have a kind of a correlation to the uh, uh, to the uh, to their surroundings, to their context, of course. And together they serve, of course, a bigger purpose. So, so they can also, in wordly mapping terms, I think they can also be think thought of as a kind of the basis where you build these building blocks capabilities to serve uh, uh, or to to compose larger needs or higher uh, order user needs. Mm. Composition seems really, really important to both uh, worthy mapping and DDD. And what I often think about is um, you can have the same exact components, but arranged with different connections and result like that can produce different value, which I think is a really kind of interesting idea. So so let's let's talk about how you start to develop the idea of what the I imagine like a lot of times this is about understanding what the current composition is because sometimes people don't know or sometimes the that knowledge isn't distributed equally. So like here's here's this goofy example, right? We got um Acme Co. and this is the the and thank you Joao for the the illustrating image here. Um you've got a coyote who wants to chase a roadrunner and and cause harm to the roadrunner. That's kind of the whole gag of the cartoon um and it, doing so for entertainment it's it's a bit it's a bit uh, absurd and and <laughs> product of its time um and so in order to chase the roadrunner the coyote needs to be able to surprise the roadrunner and so we've got a a roadrunner tracking app let's say <laughs> the coyote's got a phone right and the phone's got 5g connection or whatever and it has a little mobile app that has that tracks where the roadrunner is, and so the coyote can lay plans and you know figure out where to be. Um, and there are a couple other apps here in play. So so one is uh, in order to trap the roadrunner, they need like a two D wall to three D space app so that you can convert uh, a flat space into a three D wall and vice versa. I think we've seen usually that happen to the coyote where the coyote tries to run into a into a tunnel, but the tunnel is just a flat wall, and somehow the Roadrunner can do it, but the Coyote can't. So the Coyote's going to fight back and <laughs> get control of this 2D, 3D space problem. And then we've got GiantAnvil.exe and a Rocket app, which I'm going to say that those are self-explanatory for the purposes of blowing up the Roadrunner. Um, and of course, 
like any good application infrastructure stack, uh, we don't want the Roadrunner being able to access the information. <laughs> um, and so we need access management. Uh, and that requires a database. So like the idea of like who users are and things like that, there's some sort of like storage component of um, the application isn't stateless, right? It's stateful. And then we have to negotiate that identity provider relationship where in order to give access, we have to know who you are and also what you're allowed to see. And the way we do that is with a negotiation between the credentials that you provide and the identity provider checking those credentials against like an LDAP backend or something like that. So this is like, it's been a while since I've been a systems administrator, so I don't know what's what's what, what's a reasonable story anymore for an application. But I, I figure this is like, this is a scenario and it's probably right in some ways and wrong in some other ways. But I drew this as a value chain, which means you've got the users at the top and they've got relationships of dependency. So what needs what else? And the components are broken down as I would break them down with worthy mapping, somewhat arbitrarily, whatever my personal preference is. And so here's the value chain. But I suspect this is a different way of slicing that scenario than domain-driven design might might slice it. So what is that difference? How, how would you approach this with a DDD kind of attitude? And maybe Joao, I'll pose this to you and then Shin, we can follow up with uh, additional critique there. Yeah, definitely. So what I see with domain-driven design and when we talk about domains as, as Chin poses is, is the purpose, right? Why are we doing this? If we hmm. are a bank, we might have different business lines. And that is massive by nature. What domain-driven design does very well is that embraces that message, message, right? So we can start there. We can start with these big boundaries. What are our business lines? Do we do private accounts and business accounts and small and medium enterprises, gigantic corporations, because we need different uh, um, ways to handle that money if we are a bank, right? Uh, and that is one part. And then the second part is when we go towards solution, right? Towards the 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 the, the purpose space. By the way, this this uh, uh, the proposition space. Sorry, this is the the new two names was discussed in virtual DDD actually with Jade as well. Uh, was a very fun. So cool. we get away from problem and solution space and more purpose and proposition. Hmm. And there is where we start using visualizations like context map. What are our boundaries could look like? If we have a concept of a current account, where this ends for a private entity uh, like myself, I'm just an individual, or are things different? And then we become more and more explicit, right? So we embrace fuzziness on one side, and then we try to get a proposition uh, a working system for there. And um, it's it's two different phases. And usually what we uh, grow inside of the community is techniques like event storming, especially the big picture. Get these people on the room uh, 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 pre-2020, uh, right? Uh, Post-2020, get these people on Zoom <laughs> and pull, pull Miro and start pulling uh, 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 post-its on the wall. Because the basic premise was not to have uh, over-complicated protocol, like for instance, UML, you need to know direction, just the right mm. stuff and put stuff on on a big wall. And then we, we change post-its. Then we figure out domains, we embrace messiness, we ask questions. But the most important thing is that we get to a common ground. We're going to discover if between Sheen and myself, we are speaking about the same concepts or not. And if we don't speak about the same concepts, we say, okay, draw a line there, you go left, I go right. And that is the, 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 the biggest difference on approaches. When we agree on the, 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 the boundaries, when we agree that things are different and there are some transitions, then we move to, to software creation, right? Then we move what is so-called the tactical patterns and go towards software. Mm. The very interesting thing that I see, especially for uh, the worldly mapping community, what maps really well is the strategic part of TDD. How 
do I classify my relationships? How my relationships inside a, a, a bounded context can change? And that is, in my opinion, what Worldly Maps capture very well. That is when a component moves, for instance, from product, I have Salesforce installed on my data center to using Salesforce as SaaS. So I lose some flexibility or I move my database from my data center to the cloud. And then I cannot configure my database options in the way that I want. I just need to use what cloud provider gives to me. That has influence in the capabilities and that we get back to the social part, how I handle this system. And 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 this is the, 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 the perspective on DDD that is very powerful because the definitions inside of the components can be described uh, in a different way that Worldly Maps can't. So this is the way that start started, uh, but the community has evolved a lot, especially in the last seven years, uh, which is very interesting. And uh, now we start to go towards other communities and combining different things, which is very interesting. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna do a mistake. I'm gonna make a mistake on purpose, and then I'm gonna maybe see if you two can help correct me. Um, okay, so we've got our our Acme Acme co value chain, and I'm I'm gonna turn this into a worthy map by adding the the evolution dimension here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna oversimplify what I think DDD is, <laughs> and then you can tell me exactly what I've got gotten wrong. And we can maybe have some some fun with that. So here I am. I've got my Wordly Map uh, template. I'm just gonna quickly like do a, my my 30 second evaluation of how evolved everything is. I feel like LDAP's commodity credentials input should be you know generally accepted in commodity. Identity providers are a little harder to manage. I'm gonna put those in late product. Service providers late product. I could be wrong, right? But who knows. Um, I'm just gonna keep shuffling things around here and entirely my opinion. And also making half of this up, right? So chasing the road, 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 the roadrunner is the cost of doing business here. <laughs> I would say that blowing up the roadrunner is just a demand. It's not strictly necessary, <laughs> uh, especially since it never happens. Uh, successfully so okay entertainment cost of doing business okay so so here's our like rough worthy map right and uh maybe just for the sake of novelty i'll say that the the rocket app is a new thing that nobody's ever seen before and so now we've got kind of a, a, a nice spread of activities across the evolutionary axis from and, and again from left to right we've got genesis custom built product and commodity everything evolves in worthy mapping terms and when I hear domain-driven design, I'm like, oh, right. Well, Wardley draws these lines sometimes, like this, where he says teams tend to have both attitude and aptitude. Like, people who enjoy ref like making um, things the same or operationalizing them and making them repeatable... Um, are, are going to probably want to work on things that are in commodity or late product. Whereas people who are really comfortable with continuous improvement and just always making something like better and better and better are going to play more nicely with things in like late custom and product. Meanwhile, uh, the absolute uh, mad scientists who love failure and love trying things and making it work once, you know, will, will enjoy this kind of like, more weirder Genesis side of the picture here. So Shin, I, I, you might be cringing at this point because what I've done is I've, I've, I've drawn domains of a sort, but this is oversimplifying domain driven design enormously. And I have, I suspect it has something to do with context mapping and with, uh, it's actually, uh, yeah, I was just about to say what you just have done is very much strategic DDD. Oh, so, cool. uh, so, 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 um, uh, there is, um, 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 there is kind of a, you know, a, a simplified, uh, uh, conception of DDD being threefold. One is called strategic DDD. The other, uh, uh, Joao has already mentioned is technical, tactical DDD. And then there is also a third leg called collaborative discovery. So mm. uh, oversimplified. Uh, and so, um, so the not tactical 
like oh, in sorry. TAC. <laughs> 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 right. So would you just have that? So in strategic DDD, we operate with something called um, a a um, strat- uh, so so uh, domain subdomain types, core domain, supporting subdomains. And generic subdomains. Okay. And you've probably already sensed there is a kind of a similarity to wordly mapping because core domain that's where you want to differentiate. That's where you want to you know that you have a value pro- proposition that is, that makes you different from from the crowd. Mm. <laughs> so that's probably your rocket app. And then uh-huh. there will also be that will also be your uh, there's an, a different uh, uh, there are three subdomain types basically in the uh, in the uh, DDD. Um, uh, vocabulary. The uh, second one is uh, uh, something called supporting subdomain or supporting domain. It's also okay. And the third one is called generic uh, subdomain. So, awesome. so the gen- yeah, so the generic ones are more in the categories of commodity slash product. Something that you can buy off the shelf. You should consider buying off the shelf. It's, you definitely don't differentiate. It's just a must. And there are there are a lot of people who are doing it much more efficiently than you do. Mm. The supporting subdomain is not a differentiator, but you don't have probably a mature a, 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 a solution on the market. And then you've got to take the pain to develop that yourself. Mm, um, that makes sense. Like, a, yeah, a lot of the compliance solutions, for instance, in the bank, that's, that's supporting because you don't make money out of being compliant, but you've got to be compliant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> makes sense. Yep. Um, Right. So, uh, so that's pretty, what you have just done is pretty much strategic DDD, but you've also done something called tactical DDD. Ooh. So the tactical DDD is actually, uh, we operate with the uh, uh, concepts such as entities, okay. uh, value objects. Um, and, um, um, and, 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 and if you look at entities, if you had, look at your, your middle block that that supporting subdomain, you can see there are a lot of verbs there. You can see surprise. You can see trap. Um, that's uh, uh, those verbs could be because if you talk about entity, you could think about an entity called road runner, which has a series of attributes, but it also has kind of behavior. Mm. So by modeling those behaviors, you are kind of fulfill fulfilling a kind of a purpose. So your road runner has uh, something to be uh, the behavior to be surprised and to be trapped. That will be a little bit different, probably, from Joao's <laughs> Roadrunner. <laughs> so that makes <laughs> that's that that that's actually uh, uh, now we're doing entity modeling. So that's oh, cool. also tactical DDD uh, as well. Um, yeah, and so if you draw those lines between your potatoes, the, the thick lines, <laughs> then you would have a context mapping, and that's part of strategic DDD. Um, and, and those potatoes, as I call them, because some, some people refer to them as potatoes. I love this. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, they ideally, uh, uh, they are uh, either subdomains or uh, uh, in, in the problem space, we call them subdomains. But in the solution space, we also call them bounded context. Ideally, there is a one to one. But as the business evolves, it gets messier. Uh, there is not a one to one mapping between subdomain and bounded context mm. uh, due to the legacy lens- landscape. So I think you've done a lot of things. Uh, okay. And then I just want have one last comment about the third leg, since I mentioned it, the collaborative di- discovery. Yeah. There are, that's about visualization, that there is a very strong uh, concept called ubiquitous language, UL, in DDD. And the whole collaborative discovery process, like what Joao has mentioned with event storming, with user story mapping, with even... I think you know it. I also misused <laughs> wordly mapping to do my DDD discovery. That's all about developing a common language to communicate between each other. Like my eight squads, if they don't speak the same language, they've got to, they, 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 they would communicate less effectively. So mm-hmm. that's all about visualizing the, the differences, similarities, and developing a language. And, and there, my last comment would be, if I had to... If I were the one to be to model this domain, I would start from collaborative discovery because I don't feel comfortable doing my strategic DDD now because I don't play I haven't played this game at all. So I would like to understand what this whole flow is. So I would start from really humble event storming to to map out a very messy landscape. And then ah, I dare okay. do strategic DDD. I don't dare to go from uh, like 
my point of departure in this space with this domain, with my current knowledge of this domain, would never be strategic DDD to start with. Okay, I love that you called event storming humble. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, what? And, and Joao, I'll, I'll I'll ask you this: like when it comes to event storming, um, what makes it humble? <laughs> <laughs> like what is is it the discovery? Uh, it's a great one. Uh, so um, I also can I suggest a guest so you can even bring Alberto. Then also you're gonna have a very very fun uh, mapping. Sure. So, uh, uh, but I do believe that what Shin is referring to is that it's it's the the cost of doing an event storm a storming session is low, right? Because it's just about the post its. And as I refer, the protocol itself, it's easy. Have one concept, uh, one master concept, right? If we, uh, there are several types of event storming and we are talking about big picture here, right? The, 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 it's a domain event that is relevant for the business and you write on an orange sticky in the past, sen the past tense. And then you put that in a timely fashion and you can have swim lanes when processes diverge and then things merge. It's 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 pretty basic, and this looks like BPM from the old style and flow charts and stuff like that. But it's very low, low tech, but enables discussions, and this is what I like when you 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 put the theme for this episode that we did it. We get to the basics. Yes, we get to the basics because Eric Evans, that wrote all about these patterns was with small talk community, the, the, the same folks that start Agile, right? Where uh, Rebecca was and all of these great folks was. And this is about collaboration, a thing that we forgot. And I think that I like with the community, we keep popping up and uh, it's humble, but also it's needed, right? We can start there. We start with questions, people that know uh, uh, and just draw and uh, be wrong do mistakes on purpose and, and go, right? Discover together. And now Excellent. that you mentioned Alberto, Alberto uh, has this uh, very funny descri description of event storming. Three steps, right? Make a mess, step one. Step two, uh, uh, clean it up. Step three, get something out of it. <laughs> That's it. So. And, and 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 that's uh, you know in event storming, in, especially in big picture, that's you uh, um, people start with solo modeling, and then you merge the perspectives into a timeline, uh, and that's definitely a really interesting exercise to see. Okay, uh, we actually the biggest surprise for sometimes is that people didn't even know that they disagree. And that by the time they have to, they are forced to merge their solo models into an enforced timeline. They started to, you know, argue, and they started to 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 uh, uh, um, um, compare, and they start to know. Ah, okay, it's we see things. I thought we see things the same way, but actually we don't. <laughs> right. Mm. So so to eliminate the unknown unknowns is is an, a heuristic in DDD. Oh, okay. This is really fascinating. So, okay. Didn't even know they disagree. Eliminate the unknown unknowns. So it's kind of about like discovering those blind spots in a way. Um, this, this sounds really familiar to me in, in, in worthy <laughs> mapping. And I, I think I've with worthy mapping, th there are a couple places where that like those a disambiguation moments start to happen and the common language part of this starts to take off and it's often whenever we're even trying to decide what the parts are so that's the easy one but then you get you get basically people using the same word in multiple ways and that's always fun and so then you ask them to draw relationships between things and that's the next moment when they'll go wait a minute that's not the way that works yes it is da, 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 da. and then you have like a moment of disambiguation the third moment is whenever they have to do evolution Whenever they have, to, they have to place the thing um, from left to right, according to whether it's in Genesis, custom built product or commodity. And that the reason I think for that moment is because you're describing, you're basically reverse engineering the characteristics of a thing. Is it high failure or low failure or somewhere in between? 
Is it uh, about volume operations or is it about making it work for the first time or somewhere in between? And we start to, I, I love doing this thing um, now, which I, I think I've stolen from, from a couple different good facilitators like Judy Reese and Mark Kilby and all these other lovely folks. Um, like doing um, in, in the chat, I'll say, okay, everyone, we're talking about, I don't know, uh, let's say credentials input. The, the login page. <laughs> okay, on on the count of three, I want you to, to type in chat whether you think it's a stage one activity, a stage two activity, a three or a four stage activity. And so one, two, three, boom. And then you see like a three, a three, a three, a four, a four, and then a one. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, interesting. And it's, it's not that that person is wrong. It's that that person is seeing something that everyone else isn't seeing. And right, then you have a conversation, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, is, is similar techniques with Evan Storming, right? So uh, uh, advertisement here. This is a time of advertisement. Right? Yes. <laughs> when we are on these discussions, when uh, we go to clean it up, is when we start to use the concepts of hotspots. Where do we disagree? And here is where we play with with our mind our mind likes to finish a story and and evan storming basically is telling telling a story it's a storyline and the techniques as as facilitators that was distilled was exactly the same put this ever uh, put this odd spot describe it continue and move in the end that you clean up the mess go back and look how many of these stickies usually we use pink because uh, it goes nicely with orange by the way, I'm colorblind, so uh, I just trust the people that can see colors. <laughs> and uh, and um, But we can dot vote. We can discuss what is the next constraint that we have in the system. What is the next thing that we really need to deep dive? And these have a, a positive effect. That is, we don't go into polarizations too soon. Rather, okay, here is the first problem. We need to fix it. No, we acknowledge it and we move forward and i bring this back also towards the role of software architect my very opinionated opinion is that software architect should facilitate this okay there is a problem here probably this problem already have three years or four years plus one day minus one day will hurt the business probably not i had a situation drawing a context map that i told the group 20 uh, enterprise architects more than 20 years on same company and start, okay, let's focus on what we agree. And we agree on 70% of the map. Cool, let's not discuss that. Let's discuss the other 30%. And at least we solve a problem with 10 years. And this is this collaborative discovery that we can do together. The, the, the discovery, are we talking about the same thing or not? Or do you know something that I don't know? And it's a very cheap way, very humble way to discover that inside of our enterprise, right? Yes, and it's also a very honest way. If you think about it, if you interview an executive that uh, maybe ordered some some consultancy hours, uh, you ask him, okay, what is the, what is what do you think is the biggest problem? Uh, he would tell you one, two, three, four. But if you have done event storming, those problems would avert, emerge out of those conversations, out of those hotspots uh, Joel talked about. People would converge, people would argue about those, some things, and, 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 and you can see that people really have passion for, for making a point. And that's a very honest moment because that, that, that canvas, that event storm, storming canvas, that, messy, that, that messiness won't lie. And you know exactly if you're solving the right problem. I think Alberto also told an anecdote sometimes that uh, there was once he walked, he, he just told the executive bluntly that, uh, uh, sorry, you, you have hired me, hired me to solve the wrong problem. We have proof for that it's a different problem you need to solve. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, I love that so much. Yeah, okay, that that makes a lot of sense. So the problems emerge from an examination of the details of the context and the negotiation that, that happens as a result of that allows us to to make the <laughs> the problems conspicuous and we all agree on them because we've been working together to identify them and to actually disagree about certain things and then at the end of the day it's not just an executive saying, "Well, we need to do this, this and this." It's like, no, the, we, we looked 
at the situation and the situation is telling us what's wrong and now we are going to 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 actually make the decision about like which things to focus on first and so on so it seems like a very like empowering way to go about it because it emerges from the data like from the from the real world rather than from some sort of um arbitrary like singular opinion about how things work filtered opinion right with the with different purpose right uh, mm. Uh, mm. being mm. nasty here mm. but uh, right i need to get my bonus and my assignment is to fix <laughs> fix yeah. this problem exactly. so this is the problem on the other way also allows people to take different perspectives if she and i work on different departments both have pain some parts of the system are not working really well but maybe I understand that her department, because it's compliance, we need to get our banking license right. That's for she got more budget to fix it, mm. right? So also we have mechanisms to put things in perspective without going to escalations, which is very, very interesting. Uh, and uh, with collaborative discovery, not only with event storming, uh, we combine event uh, worldly maps, we combine different things on our practices. But the, the, on the topic of collaborative discovering, that also serves as an argument. Why that department is getting so many budget? Well, now it's pretty much evident. They have a few hotspots for reason A, B, or C doesn't matter. And now for, for business reasons, we need to protect that. Mm. Uh, and, and, and once again, we avoid escalation parts and, and the power struggles. We can have these honest conversation among the people that are executing the 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 the, the, the work that are closer to the problems. It, that rem that reminds me very much that ex escalation path problem. I think that was how we all met. Was actually doing a workshop in around this or a related set of concepts. Is like a lot of times, if you have to wait for authority to resolve issues, you end up with all sorts of negative behaviors such as authority-based decision making or just do what i say um and that that has an injustice to it in terms of how the organization is formed because lots of ways that you know authority figures don't have the information about how things really are and so they're basically making decisions based on fantasy as opposed to the way things are in reality and so part of what i think we were all talking with jabe about is the peer-to-peer -peer negotiation side of this instead of escalation path as a like so going instead of going up and then down and hopefully getting the problem resolved through the authority pathway let's negotiate directly between peers at our level and make sense of things ourselves and, and this is what one of the things that i i talk about with worthy mapping is I, I think it's an empowering framework because when simon's whole purpose is democratizing strategy right but the implication of that is that not just executives can do strategy work it's literally anyone who is capable of making sense of their system and noticing how it could be and then deciding what the intention is for that system, even despite what the executive wants. And that creates a very interesting dynamic where like literally if you know things that other people don't know, you can make decisions that they can't make, right? And so if you as a, as a person doing like maybe your middle management, maybe you're actually on the line like doing software development or something like that if an executive asks for something but they don't understand the details and and so they're asking for something that's wrong or problematic well you can work within that because you have a greater granularity of control through something like worthy mapping or i i think like the methods you're describing here as well is one way of doing this mm -hmm. you can basically create a pocket of coherence in the organization where Despite the nonsense that's being asked for, you're able to actually create a purposeful system of your design, and it happens to somehow resolve against the checksum of, of authority. It's like, oh, are you doing what I want? Kinda. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But the real design is doing something different. Yep. Yeah. And also... On the other way around, right? The, 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 you, and ben, you and Jay talk about that lamination, but I also feel that is important, architects and software engineers and all the folks that create software, right? Designers and uh, everyone involved on those teams. With these techniques, 
we also get an opportunity to ask questions. And if we have these executives with this power, we also have an opportunity to really understand because in theory, they should see the landscape. In theory, they have access to the information that people don't have, what the investors want, what, uh, right? And then things start to make sense. People get, oh, now that fragment of that story that you asked me three months ago now makes sense and things can start going together, right? Yeah. So it's 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 a road with both ways, which is very very interesting. So uh, 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 maybe I'm diverging now, but a thing that especially I did when uh, we were in same buildings, I travel a lot around the country. I'm in the Netherlands. And rather tell people that we're going to do event storming, I, I tell them to ask me a story and I end over uh, post-its, which is a great way that people don't fight the protocol. And doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it is World Worldly Map or, or any other uh, type of, 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 of uh, uh, technique to describe, but just ending out these and people start describing, very happy describing the world according to them, helps all to unlock these conversations. Uh, another situation that I had was doing this with an e-com company that I work with, uh, trying to entangle uh, uh, part of the system and a developer that pretty much works since the foundation just walk by and told, oh, that is wrong because it doesn't work like that. So the power of, of doing this spontaneously and also with open doors where people can go, you know, gorilla style, uh, really helps to generate these insights that everyone benefits from. Mm. unless you have a really oppressive management. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is, though, um, as this is, again, very opinionated uh, 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 from my experience. Good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we like opinions. <laughs> I, I just feel because um, um, before I, I, I used uh, event storming a lot before I even got to know uh, uh, Wortley Mapping, and I was from the workshop from uh, UNJ from November last year, right? So, um, and then um, I think one of the blind spots with uh, techniques like event storming is that you put all the events, you, you sort all the events on a timeline and they are all at the same level. And you involve uh, people, oh yeah, there's there's, an, a, there's a, um, something that is very important in DDD that is called domain experts. Mm. Mm -hmm. We involve a lot of domain experts, but if you think about the term domain experts, they are business re representatives. They put their perspective uh, of what needs to happen, what kind of events, uh, uh, like uh, uh, product uh, ordered, uh, uh, shipped, uh, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's from their perspective. Usually, because I usually work back uh, with the uh, backend domains, uh, mm. producing APIs and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes the the user perspective just evaporates Ooh, because you get okay. the you get the uh, you get the the business domain expert's own perspective of how things are supposed to work. So that's that's one blind spot I see, and and then at the time when um, when I got to uh, uh, use uh, uh, Wortley mapping, I really like this fact that it has a tree, right? It has a anchor, and you can't you, you have to traverse the the need from top to down, and that gives a really really good mental flow of. Uh, why are you doing this? Mm, okay. <laughs> why, why why are you having this uh, this particular capability, right? So that's the that's the user perspective, and I think that's one of the blind spots that by backend domain sometimes forget uh, that's being extremely persona and user oriented, uh, and then uh, we also had a very interesting discussion about what problem space really is. So I think in DDD people, um, some people at least I experienced have a very very uh, uh, some, somewhat narrow uh, definition of problem space that's seen from the domain experts perspective, but the problem space is actually larger from the user's perspective. The problems the users are trying to solve and face and the challenges is ra ra much bigger than what your business domain is. Mm. So I think having that perspective is really important. That's where I think Wortley mapping gives an edge to uh, also an anchor to to uh, to a very messy and and uh, you can say one dimensional <laughs> event storming <laughs> canvas. I usually use them in combination. First event storming and then pick a one user to do a kind of a, a value chain and then uh, do uh, the uh, oh yeah that that brings me to point number two where I think Wortley mapping is really uh, uh, provides a powerful tool. That's the why of movement. I 
I, so many times I work with teams that think, oh, they do custom coding. They, they, you know, their domain is in the custom build, right? They, they, they produce these fantastic APIs, but once they have that value chain and they have started discussing, is it Genesis, is it custom build? Uh, and, and they would usually do a good placement in the custom build. But then when we talk about the future, the strategic movement direction, it's a very humbling moment for most teams. And they're saying, oh yeah, actually what we're doing is nothing special. In five years, we definitely should be in the commodity or product. Mm. Otherwise we'll be like made obsolete, right? By, by the competitor. So I feel that is a really, um, the word mapping that, that evolution dimension is really, really powerful, it's especially for teams that are kind of being myopic about their importance. <laughs> 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 I'm so glad you said all that because it's it's okay. This gets me ex excited, and, and I'm I'm going to um kind of take us in a, a completely different direction because of what you said. <laughs> um, and that that's that's my secret purpose of of having you two on a live stream and talking to you about DDD and more the mapping because what you just described, Shin, was like basically a blueprint for a question that I've had, um, which is how. How do we create centers of practice for Wardly mapping without doing it from scratch and trying to literally make like Wardly mapping for architects or Wardly mapping for software developers or what have you? Because here's my basic theory. Wardly mapping is useful. And the way that we make it useful is by making it domain specific. And like Wardly mapping is a big giant thing of, of raw material and different people are going to have interest in different parts of the tools, different time spans, uh, like depending on which time span you're in, you're going to use worthy mapping differently and all that kind of stuff. So like in order to share how to do worthy mapping, I think we need to make the examples domain specific. I, I think we need to like make the um, like who is seen worthy mapping domain specific. And so I have this like weird idea and I'm, I'm just going to like off to the left here, redraw my, uh, <laughs> my naive map of how I think this is, this is going to work or how I think it's going to have to work. So, and this is going to be like a three minute map. So we're not going to get, I'll wrap us up in five minutes. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think like people need to know worthy mapping because it's useful. I'm I'm not going to get into the specifics of all that, but it's it's going to be useful for different reasons for different people. And so if I say I want to serve architects and they're going to get something out of mapping, whatever it happens to be, there's like this existing social network or social graph of architects with common interests and common concerns that exists out there. And so rather than reinvent a social network for worthy mapping for architects, my belief right now is, hey, you've got virtual DDD, you've got DDD EU, you've got all these folks already doing all this important work, and you've already done all the work to make sense of which parts of worthy map can be integrated into your existing processes. And so like, I'm, I'm looking at this, like you've got event storming, you've got um, context mapping, And like, you've got all these common interests, right? That you're like, what do architects care about? Common interests. And you use these tools in order to solve those problems. And so I'm like, worthy mapping has a bunch of parts. You've got evolution. You've got uh, the value chain representation, which you were just describing. And then what else did you say? The user perspective. So like the value chain also like kind of builds that in a little bit. Um, so with with that in mind, I'm thinking, well, worthy mapping, like why reinvent the wheel? Why try to invent like a community of practice of worthy mapping for architects? Why not add these bits and pieces into the existing kind of interest areas? So the, the question that I would pose for you is like, that's my hypothesis right now. Like, like with this version of things, I'm just going to assume that architects care about a bunch of stuff and that they use a bunch of tools to describe how they care about those things. And I think the value chain and evolution 
are two things that they could add to their toolkit rather easily because they're already doing this work. So what what should I be doing? And this is the question that I'll pose to both of you. What should I be doing? What should we be doing as a community to make that future easier? I mean, is that the right future? Lots of questions. <laughs> Lots of questions for three minutes. <laughs> it's a great one. Uh, uh, maybe we need five minutes after, right? So we capture both of opinions. Sorry to jump here because these... I'm really, really excited about that because I'm working with a colleague exactly on on the same thing. Shameless plug here. We have a thing that we call intended, intent-oriented architecture, right? Mm. That mm. combines the promise theory with DDD and enterprise architecture because enterprise architecture went to the, to, to the shadows because you know certifications and big stuff, but there's important concepts like a business capability map, service definition. Don't confuse service definition with my service, IT service, right? It's about providing a service. And what we did was, okay, let's use user map to entice, to discover what is the problem. Hmm. And then enterprise architecture is really good in the definition because it's architects, right? It's, it's zero or one. And what we are integrating as well now is the, the concept of evolution of early mapping. Because what we find in these enterprises is that they stall in time and using the concepts of early map, and now this is your context map that it's good on relationships, is very bad on evolution, can evolve and what is the effect on your services and your business capabilities. Because when you talk with business capabilities, enterprise architects understands you and more important, executives also understand the risks for the organizations. So I believe that at this time, we are in one of those singularity moments where enterprise uh, um, enterprise architecture communities, and at least here in Europe, the folks on Norway and Poland are working with this with EDD. And then I cross also with you, both of you with Worley Maps. So I think that we are on those convergent points and we need to bring to these alive because at least I know now three different groups working on same ideas, which is just awesome. <laughs> Time to yeah. harness the groups. Yeah. Shin, yeah. do you do you have a couple extra minutes to to get to definitely? Give us? Okay. Definitely. I, I um well I don't I don't have anything else. I just uh, I need to just need to have dinner one uh, one time. That's <laughs> important. <laughs> <laughs> But but definitely, I'm also very excited about this piece. And I think at one time we discussed in uh, in, in uh, one of the virtual DDD uh, meetups, uh, we drew these uh, Venn diagrams, right? So so uh, uh, what kind of uh, um, sense making and decision making tooling, discovery tooling, uh, do we use in the DDD community? Mm. So we have you know all the these DDD um, uh, 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 tools, but then you also have product management. If you Ooh. think about the uh, how, how APIs and the service orientation, all that, that's all product management. So how to think of your software being a product, how to organize your pr uh, platform team, thinking uh, uh, developer experience, thinking about how to make your product usable. That's 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 uh, that's one inter intersection, product management and DDD. And then you also have this uh, with this, this whole huge space of sense making, Ken Evan. Right, and, and I can't even name all those things. Uh, Jape mentioned uh, this uh, sense-making framework. I think you also recommended uh, one thing. I also can remember these sense-making frameworks. Um, um, and then, uh, um, so so in the product management, you have you know these lean value tree and such. And I I definitely I definitely remember clearly. Wortley mapping is one of those. Uh, then diagram circles in we drew in the uh, in that virtual DD space. So Wortley mapping is being pulled into the DD space as one of the tools. So as I as I see it, every tool has its you know sweet spot and and blind spot. So it's when we got kind of a tool fatigue, and then you it's like a, 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 um, I have a, a DDD friend called uh, Marijn Heusenfeld. He he usually compels this to uh, to a DJ set, right? So, so it's kind of a mix. Uh, once you have done this thing, and then you, you you can probably try some other things. And because the tooling is different, you've definitely got some new perspectives. So, so it's kind of <laughs> like that. Oh, that, that's, um, a, that's a great one. Yeah. And I've yeah. met Parayan, a fabulous person to know in this space as well. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm 
I feel com- like I, I, I like content. Like I, that's one of the things that I can do is mm. I can pump out content and show examples and things like this. What can I do to support you both as you're integrating these tool like these worthy mapping tools which like you don't need to come in and say hey i have a new methodology everyone i think you could just say hey here, here's evolution do you see how it changes things yeah i have a i have one very intriguing uh, uh thought uh, because i i haven't figured out how to use one aspect of worthy mapping yet okay and i hope you can help me uh, and that's the last part of the the, the cycle it's basically the, the last part. If you remember uh, uh, Simon's uh, Kimsey story, mm. <laughs> that the, the, this uh, innovate, leverage, and commoditize, yep. right? Yeah, and that uh, I think he called uh, called that one a, a future sensing engine. Yep. And I feel we're really, really bad at this also in the DDD community because a domain is either in the custom build is or in the community. But that fast movement is that movement that gives you gives you the edge. And I feel we're really, really bad at designing and articulating, visualizing that bit. So you can you can do a, a point in time map, uh, but how can you use your map in such a st- strategic way that you can say, I start with something custom built and I quickly move it to commodity, and then I can create some higher order products. Like, you know, we have those, all those API thing. I haven't figured out a way how to include that bit that that uh, you know dynamic movement cycle str- strategics the final the gist of that thing that makes you stand out mm. really t- into into my ddd work to be honest okay and i've been uh, thinking about it a lot so that's basically a a, a feature request for you <laughs> okay <laughs> I, i've made a note <laughs> We'll get back to you. <laughs> Ticket entered. No, I'm just kidding. I know an illustration of ILC would be a great fun kind of thing to do sometime. And I think it would, it would be fun to, to talk more about the leadership part of this for architects, because architects are thinking about really interesting things like cost of change and like w- what the system is disposed towards. And I think that is like, that is, if you apply it more broadly, it's basically strategy. What is this? What is the disposition of the system presently? What is it going to do without you? <laughs> like, regardless of what you wanted it to do, what is it going to do as it is? And then, how are you going to behave in order to align yourself with that? And then, and only then, start to see how to change it. And I think that kind of thought process could be really interesting. If we got architects thinking strategically, that would be really fun. Yeah, exactly. And and then just uh, if we had just one qu- time for one more question, that is, I haven't what one more thing I haven't figured out is the term of if is the the definition of core domain in that context of uh, context of movement, because if you think about Kimsey, wh- what Simon wants to do is actually to push it to the commodity side, to push it into a generic subdomain. But he starts with core. He starts by doing something that nobody else does, right? So, so all of a sudden, a core domain becomes a generic, uh, becomes a supporting, and then a generic. So, yeah. So, so, so basically, um, the 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 nature of a, a strategic DDD is suddenly not so strategic anymore because it's in a constant flux. It you move your core core domain all the way through, and how do you? become strategic about it. That's another thing. I I don't know how to facilitate that conversation. I think it's kind of too uh, philosophical for me. Maybe Jade can do it, but I can't. <laughs> I'm getting so excited because, oh man, we could do so many fun things. And we could use like, th- th- there's some work by um, Frank Hales uh, around like uh, innovation uh, and transitions, socio-technical mm. regime transitions. And we could get into that. And like Simon talks about Nokia in the mm-hmm. in his book a bit. And I think like what is core is a transient thing. And so it's, it, oh, we could have so much fun with that. So, okay. <laughs> number one, ILC. Number two, core, like core domain and domain transitions in general. I, I'm excited. This is cool. <laughs> <laughs> it is because this is the question, right? And uh, um, I'm doing more and more C-level work, right? I'm I currently, I'm an interim CTO. And this is exactly the point, right? How yeah. to, and this is also the passion I discovered that is my passion, how to enable the system to keep evolving, 
right? Ooh, yeah. And and to do these transitions, which is very very interesting. Uh, I have my own opinion, and and the, the thing that pops up with with core domains is that one thing that I learn is I've been basic budgeting skills, because especially when we are talking about that level. Uh, and, and giving the example, we do something custom made that we know that's going to be commodity is not our will not be the core business of our company. But if I have budgety skills, I can show the company to create a different company. And then I go to the war with this component while the company can evolve to the other side. So what I realized was I need to know how to do business cases and budgeting. My, it's not my strong case. I'm not a CFO, but this helps. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's that basic stuff that always gets us yep. <laughs> yeah yeah but that's, it's really interesting Joao. I, 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 I sometimes i wonder if eric evans when when you know sometimes it, it, a lot of in a lot of his talks he, he's he mentioned okay if you did, do ddd work it's kind of expensive so you, sh you should only do it on core domain right but you if you intentionally want to go to the generics in DDD. Usually when we think of generic subdomain, you think about, okay, build or buy. So, uh, so, so if it's generic, then you don't need to put any efforts into modeling it. You probably just want to off, uh, outsource it. But, but, uh, but I feel that that movement about being strategic about a generic subdomain in the future, that bit is not present in the blue book that's my personal humble opinion <laughs> i don't know how to see it. uh, it's evolution right it's evolution yeah, of exactly. practices and yeah. it's evolution of the 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 the, the um, communities cross right you talk about knevin uh, i read the knevin book and simon has a small chapter there and simon and um cannot remember the author of of mm. knevin sorry snowden, uh, snowden. They just cross on a very late point of both Knevin and Worley Map. And once again, those was singularity points when they cross and they said, oh, crap, actually my doctrine and my Knevin principles actually bound together. And I think that that is the magic, right? Because now we are crossing and having this conversation. Also, we can bring Knevin folks and, right, we can bring all the folks together and we're going to go, oh, but we already solved that problem. Oh, and also we solved that problem. It's, it's, it's magical, I will say. So mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, all of these questions, I think that we are at that point. And also what I like is that, especially with the community, we didn't get technical for some reason. And I see the same with Worldling uh, community. Mm -hmm. Tools didn't went in that space, right? When uh, uh, sometimes certain communities, SOA was a really great example. And then for some reason, the SOAP, protocol just make hostage of that all of that so uh, uh concept and just died right so for some reason our communities didn't got uh, hostage of of tooling and didn't die because of that which looking back see some evolution there and some benefits right Mm -hmm. And then, and then this concept of uh, flow—that's uh, one other thing that popped into my mind while while you discuss. You, you mentioned evolution, because uh, that uh, sort of uh, closes the loop. Because you started by asking uh, me, uh, uh, Ben, the question about architecture. Um, the uh, if you think, or the way I see it, is like if if uh, if our business world, if uh, if the world is not changing so fast as as it does now, any architecture would do. You can have a monolithic system because your your environment doesn't change or context doesn't change, but but the, the the truth is things change too fast these days. So you need to design hmm. your 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 architecture for to enable fast flow of change. And that's actually directly quote from a, a, a related field called team topology. Oh yeah, uh, yeah right. So so then uh, I. Th think this fast flow of change, how to proactively like uh, 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 proke this, uh, like not, not to just uh, be reactive toward the, uh, the, uh, the uh, external requirements, but also how to be strategic about it. Uh, again, using this uh, Kimsey example, uh, uh, like not being left behind due to the inertia, but, but, but design 
proactive a proactive architecture mm. and i think that's that's really lacking also in the api enabled approach i've seen so many api projects that have developed a lot of apis but they're not getting you faster they're mm. just uh, yeah, like you you just have this huge uh, repository of apis but whenever you de 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 deliver a user journey it's as slow <laughs> and oh, now you wow. have more teams to to collaborate because you you de decompose your application landscape you have so many microservices you need to coordinate you don't get faster um <laughs> Building APIs, but not getting faster. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I love, oh yeah. And, and that's like such a lovely, like Wardly thing because yeah, I mean the, the whole principle is that things that are truly behaving as stage four, they, they, that implies certain characteristics. And I think that's the immediate prompt. Like, Hey, is this repeatable? Is this, is deviation reduced to near zero? No. Why? Because that's going to be the thing that prevents people from recombining these things in interesting ways. So, okay, yes, that would be, <laughs> I have like five <laughs> problems listed out now of, of like interesting explorations and, and maybe, uh, maybe I'll be uh, harassing you both again to come back yeah. and do some live It's really stuff. bad to invite the both of us. Every time Joel mentioned something, something else popped into my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, that's, I mean, that's. Well, that's the energy, though, that I think Joao was describing. It's like it's it's the collisions in this space that are so energizing and exciting. Um, so I want to thank you both for sharing your time with me and sharing all the, these lovely ideas and, and with, with the folks who watch and, and will be watching for the foreseeable future. Right. Part, part of them, but the value of these live streams is that it's a great excuse to get something recorded so that somebody else can go back and listen to it later oftentimes at 2x, if I'm being honest, because <laughs> that's just how you consume this sort of thing. And that's great. We're, we're creating kind of the anchor points for other people to go explore these ideas now. And just by saying them out loud, it, it makes it noticeable. And so we're kind of like creating this, this generative moment for other people who are going to come in and say, oh, I could do that. And so with that in mind, uh, what I will in highly encourage everyone who's watching either live or in the future, go into the description of this video and grab the Twitter uh, profiles for both Shin and Joao and say, hey, say hello, tag us on Twitter and talk to us about the things that were interesting. And I think we'd, we'd all be more than happy to hear from you. Um, and I, I certainly would. And so... This is like the beginning of a conversation that I hope continues for years to come. And I, I really genuinely thank you for, for sharing your time with us. It's been a great pleasure. Yes. Thanks for having us. It was yes, a great fun. Indeed. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to close this out here. Um, everyone who uh, likes these sorts of things, please give us, you know, the standard like, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. I guess I'm supposed to be saying that kind of stuff now. Um, find us on Twitter. Join our events. We run um, practice sessions and we have future live streams set up. You can go to lwm.events to check those out. And if you go to lwm.events, there should be a link at the very top for workshops um, at the, in the nav bar. We have one coming up next week, uh, May 26th of 2021, where we have You Will Make Maps. It's a three and a half hour intensive. If you'd like to get a kickstart with Wardly Mapping in particular, um, I encourage you to join us for that. Um, again, follow these folks on Twitter. You can find it in the description of this video and let us know what you want to see next. You can leave a comment or find us on Twitter. Um, just let us know and we'll find folks to, uh, scratch those particular itches with that. Um, thank you for being here. I appreciate you so much and I hope to see you all again soon.